Great, welcome back. All right, time to continue our sort of quick overview as to how the greenhouse effect works. In order to understand what the greenhouse effect actually is, I mean, we now looked at the energy budget of the Earth and, the, and we saw, look, without these greenhouse gases in here doing this business of emitting and, and, and absorbing long wave radiation, the planet would be much colder, much too cold to support life. Well, we better understand then what these greenhouse gases actually are and what they're doing. Now, there are a lot of gases in the Earth's atmosphere that technically could count, uh, that, well, some of them are really good at getting out ga a bit, uh, the greenhouse effect, but some of them occur in such small amounts that we're not that worried about. If we are mainly interested in the, the, the greenhouse gases that are climatologically significant, we would talk about water vapor, carbon dioxide, methane, and a few others that we'll, talk, we'll see briefly on another slide. Um, water vapor, of course, we're not really in any control of how much of it that is in the atmosphere. That just comes from evaporation off the oceans and stuff like that. But carbon dioxide is a byproduct of the production of, uh, sorry, the burning of fossil fuels and methane. Oh, we'll learn all about where methane comes from when we do the carbon cycle and so on. All right. Greenhouse gases have the, all have the same property of being selective absorbers. Now, that's a term we've seen in a couple lectures already. It means that how much radiation they transmit, how much radiation they emit, how much radiation they absorb, depends on the wavelength of the radiation. And to help explain that, I took a figure from another textbook. This is from Atmospheric Physics by Murray Salby. And I want to use this figure to illustrate how the greenhouse gases are selective absorbers. This figure is pretty complicated. Let's kind of take it apart one piece here at a time. The x-axis of this diagram indicates the wavelength of radiation we're talking about. So the x-axis of the diagram here, I have in this red box here, and you can see it goes from about 1 micron to, I don't know, about 16 microns here. And I just pulled up this diagram that we used in a previous slide to show you where on the electromagnetic spectrum 1 micron to 16 microns is. And it's a little chunk of the electromagnetic spectrum that is in this, the range of wavelengths that we call infrared radiation, which makes it a type of long wave radiation. Not a very big chunk of the total electromagnetic spectrum, though. Why did the person who designed this figure cho choose that little wave range of wavelengths that to talk about? Oh. Well, if I show you, here is the curve for the amount of radiation being emitted by an object of about 300 Kelvin. You can see that the range of about 1 micron to about 16 microns is pretty much the bulk of the radiation that an object with a temperature of about 300 Kelvin actually emits. What do we know in the real world that has a temperature of about 300 Kelvin? Terrestrial stuff. I mean, the average temperature of the surface of the Earth is 288 Kelvin. Uh, obviously, there's places that are warmer than that, places that are colder than that. That's a fairly typical temperature for the Earth. The surface of the Earth emits about the amount of radiation shown in that top left diagram there. So this diagram over here in the bottom right is illustrating for us something about a range of wavelengths that are typical of what the Earth's surface is emitting. It is typical of what long-wave or terrestrial radiation on Earth is. Now, this diagram, then, each of these little pieces of it here shows the monochromatic transmissivity and absorptivity of different gases. You'll see, uh, when we zoom in closer, you'll see that there's one for carbon dioxide, one for water vapor, one for methane, one for nitrous oxide, etc. These are going to be showing us how, what is the monochromatic absorptivity of each of those gases at wavelengths that the atmosphere, I'm sorry, that the surface of the Earth actually emits. So this is showing us over the range of wavelengths the Earth really does emit radiation, what gases in the atmosphere are actually absorbing radiation at those wavelengths, which gases in the atmosphere are acting like greenhouse gases. Now, I did my best here in PowerPoint to try to stretch the axes of these two diagrams so that they kind of matched up. So you can see how like, um, like 10 microns in that type di top diagram uh, since I stretched it out, is now right exactly above 10 microns in that little inset that I copied up over there, and like 15 microns is directly above. I tried to make it so that they were right above and matched up, okay? I did the best I could. Now, so that makes it easier to compare than having two separate diagrams with two different scales and stuff like that. So I stretched it. All right, so that top diagram is showing us how much radiation at each of those wavelengths the surface of the Earth is actually emitting, and that kind of middle diagram there is showing us how much of that radiation is actually transmitted through the Earth's atmosphere. 
That diagram is showing us the monochromatic transmissivity, T lambda, at any given wavelength, how much radiation makes it through the Earth's atmosphere. Let me show you how this diagram works. For example, I highlighted there in a little blue box a range of wavelengths from about 8 to about 13 microns. Okay. Now, on that top diagram, which shows us how much radiation the Earth actually emits, you can see that that's pretty much the hump of the diagram. That is a range of wavelengths that the Earth actually emits a lot of radiation. Okay, at the temperature of the surface of the Earth, that is a type of radiation that actually gets emitted a lot. And in fact, if I then extend that blue box down to the other graph and look at what is the transmissivity of the Earth's atmosphere at that location, because that diagram there is for all gases added up, the real atmosphere, the transmissivity of the Earth's atmosphere in those range of wavelengths is mostly pretty high. It's near one for most of those individual wavelengths. In other words, this is a range of wavelengths that the Earth emits a lot of radiation and the atmosphere generally transmits. This is radiation that is emitted by the surface of the Earth and gets transmitted by the atmosphere. There's a word for this. This is the atmospheric window. The atmospheric window isn't a place, it's not a layer, it's not a material, it's a range of wavelengths. It's the range of wavelengths between about nine, 8 microns and about 13 microns, and it is a range of wavelengths that the Earth emits radiation at, and the atmosphere in general transmits rather than uh, absorbs. And we actually saw that back on that diagram of the Earth's, Earth's energy balance from NASA. We actually have observed that the atmospheric window is about 40.1 watts per square meter, this is the heat that is able to directly escape to space. The surface of the Earth emits it, and the atmosphere doesn't stop it. It just transmits right through the Earth's atmosphere. It's very efficient energy out for the surface of the Earth. Any radiation it emits with those wavelengths, it's out to interplanetary space, it's gone. Fantastic. The atmospheric window is a key phenomenon in the greenhouse effect. But there's actually other cool stuff going on in here, too. For example, let's look at these two ranges of wavelengths. All right, on the top diagram there, I marked from like 5 to 7 microns and from maybe 13 to 16 microns, something like that. Two different ranges of wavelengths. And if you actually look at that top diagram, which is showing you the amount of radiation the Earth's surface actually emits in those ranges of wavelengths, you know, the graph is pretty big. The area underneath those curves is pretty big. The Earth actually emits a fair amount of that kind of radiation. That is radiation that the surface of the Earth is emitting upward towards space. But if we take a look and extend that diagram down to the middle panel, which shows us the transmissivity of the Earth's atmosphere at those wavelengths, it's zero. The curve goes all the way to zero in those places. The atmosphere transmits basically none of the radiation at those wavelengths. The atmosphere, the gases that are in the Earth's atmosphere, are really, really, really good at absorbing that kind of radiation. That radiation does not make it out to space. It is quickly absorbed by stuff like carbon dioxide, water, vapor, methane, etc. in the Earth's atmosphere. Oh, well we actually saw that on the diagram from NASA that showed the energy budget. There was radiation that is absorbed by the Earth's atmosphere. This is heat that could not actually escape directly to space because the surface of the Earth emitted it, but then it gets absorbed by the atmosphere. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> Absorbing radiation, of course, warms the Earth's atmosphere. That's what absorbing does. And then, by Stefan Boltzmann's law, that radi that, the gases that did that absorbing also emit radiation. They emit that radiation in all directions, up and down. Um, but the radiation that's being emitted down by the atmosphere comes back to the surface of the Earth and warms the ground back up. Oh. Oh. So radiation in those wavelengths doesn't get away from the Earth's atmosphere. In fact, that is heat that the surface of the Earth is going to get back. Wait, there's more weird stuff going on in this diagram here. Here are three little ranges of wavelengths. Uh, I won't worry about the exact numbers here, but if you actually take a look at those three ranges of wavelengths that I have highlighted there in blue, each of those three ranges of wavelengths here, on the top panel there, which shows how much radiation the planet actually emits at those wavelengths, so, you know, the planet actually emits a fair amount of that stuff. Radiation with wavelengths like 4 microns, 7.5 microns, 13 microns. The planet emits a fair amount of that stuff, and if we extend the diagram down to the middle panel, which shows us the transmissivity of the Earth's atmosphere, <coughs> excuse me, we have an interesting story. In these ranges of wavelengths, 
the atmosphere absorbs some, but not all, of the radiation at those wavelengths. If you have radiation at a wavelength of like 4.7 microns, the atmosphere stops about half of it. The atmosphere, if the surface emits a certain amount of radiation with a wavelength of 4.7 microns, some of it will get through the atmosphere out into outer space and some of, and be gone, and some of it will get absorbed by the atmosphere. Some, but not all. Something in the atmosphere is able to absorb this stuff. That's interesting because whatever it is that's doing that absorbing, maybe it could do more. Maybe if there was more of those gases in the Earth's atmosphere, they could absorb more of that radiation. Maybe if there was less of those gases in the Earth's atmosphere, they would absorb less of that radiation. That's the parts of the graph that are bizarre and interesting because whatever's doing that absorbing, what if we had more of that gas? We've got to figure out what gases those are. So if I turn back to that uh, diagram from the uh, Salaby textbook there, which is this diagram you do not have in your textbook. Well, that bottom panel that we've been looking at was for the complete atmosphere. That was when we added all the gases together. But in the red boxes there, you can see we actually have one, two, three, four, five, six little diagrams there that illustrate the same information for six different gases. Carbon monoxide, methane, nitrous oxide, ozone, carbon dioxide, and water vapor. Okay. So, for the three ranges of wavelengths that we're interested in, where the atmosphere partially absorbs that radiation, the total atmosphere does, that's why I circled in red there. See how in those blue and red areas then, we have some absorption, but some transmission of the Earth's, of that radiation? If we actually take a look at the story there and actually look at which of those six gases is doing the absorbing, we see that for a lot of that absorbing is happening in the things I circled in red and black rather. That's carbon dioxide. Carbon dioxide has an awful lot of the absorbing at some of those wavelengths. There's not very much carbon dioxide in the Earth's atmosphere on the order of particles per, uh, parts per million. If we increased the amount of carbon dioxide in the Earth's atmosphere, this would get better at absorbing that radiation. Uh-oh. Hey, so are two other gases here. Looks like CH4, methane, and uh, NO, N2O, uh, nitrous oxide, they also don't transmit all the radiation that goes through them. And those are, tr gases are very rare in the Earth's atmosphere. What if we increase the amount of them? They would be better at absorbing that radiation. Shoot. By the way, so also is this, uh, when I have a purple there I circled, a uh, big part of the absorption of uh, radiation that is uh, incomplete is water vapor and clouds. The more water vapor and the more clouds there are in the Earth's atmosphere, the more the atmosphere absorbs long wave radiation rather than transmitting it. Uh-oh. That means that we have these greenhouse gases, especially carbon dioxide, water vapor, methane, and nitrous oxide, which currently are able to absorb some of the long wave radiation from the, from the Earth's surface, the radiation that is emitted by the Earth's surface upward, these gases absorb some of it now at their current concentrations. If we increase the amount of those gases in the Earth's atmosphere, they will absorb more. Oh, enhancing the greenhouse effect. If these concentrations of these gases increase, the amount of long wave radiation they're able to absorb will increase too. This comes to us from the hilariously named Beer's Law in meteorology. Again, that's a well-proven thing by theory and observation and so on. Oh my, this is bad news. Because if we increased the concentration of those gases, more heat would be absorbed by the Earth's atmosphere, which by Stefan Boltzmann's law means that more heat would be emitted by the Earth's atmosphere down towards the surface of the Earth, warming the ground. Uh-oh. Yeah, these greenhouse gases, they're the, they're the culprit here. Well, they're both the good guy and the bad guy, right? I mean, we, our Earth would be too cold if it weren't for them. These greenhouse gases are great at absorbing long-wave radiation that it was emitted by the surface of the Earth at some wavelengths. At other wavelengths, they transmit it. They emit long-wave radiation that gets absorbed by the surface of the Earth, warming the surface of the Earth back up. Increasing their concentration increases the, the effectiveness of the greenhouse effect at keeping the surface of the Earth warm. These greenhouse gases, carbon dioxide, water vapor, nitrous oxide, and methane, all have a natural concentration at which they occur in the atmosphere, and they're all very small. Uh, in a later chapter, a later module, we're going to learn about the fact that like 
of the Earth's atmosphere is nitrogen and 21% is oxygen. You notice they weren't on that list, okay? They're not greenhouse gases. But the very small concentration of things like carbon dioxide and methane is what determines the greenhouse effect, which is what's ultimately in control of the Earth's temperature. Oh, that sounds bad. That sounds like the greenhouse effect. That is the greenhouse effect. Like I've said many times, the greenhouse effect is natural. It's how we are enhancing it that's probably going to prove to be the problem. Now I'm going to do a little demonstration for you. This is a classic thing every teacher does when they demonstrate the greenhouse effect to help you understand what's going on. I've got some blankets here. You often hear that greenhouse gases work like a blanket for the Earth's atmosphere, uh, for the Earth's surface. And I think that's a good metaphor. I've got an afghan here, all right? Afghans are beautiful and precious and don't really keep you all that warm. Let's think of this as an atmosphere that doesn't have a very good greenhouse effect. Now, forget about the greenhouse effect for a moment, actually. This blanket has been sitting here on the floor next to me while I've been lecturing. It is not in any way warm. The blanket has the same temperature as the, as the air around us and the ground and stuff like that around us here. Okay? But if I put the blanket on, all right, my body is producing heat. That's what metabolizing food does. Before I put the blanket on, that heat would, go, would be emitted by the surface of my skin out into the room around me and was gone. Okay? I was losing heat off the surface of my body. I was at some temperature. By putting on a blanket, if I kept this blanket on for a while, the blanket warms up. If I could actually measure the temperature of the blanket, the blanket gets warmer. Where did that heat come from that warmed up the blanket? It came from me. The heat that I was giving off, that previously was just getting out into the room, is now warming the blanket up. The blanket then gives off heat, admittedly some of the heat out to the room too, but some of the heat is emitted in towards me, and I get warmer. The blanket works because I warm, heat that I was losing otherwise warms me up because it's used to warm the blanket, and then the blanket warms me. Okay, now, Afghans kind of suck. They got holes in them, they really aren't that thick, they don't really warm you all that much. Okay, now, on the other hand, I've got my sleeping bag here. I love to camp in the winter. This, this camp, I've camped in the snow lots of times in this sleeping bag. This is one heavy duty blanket. Yeah. All right. It's got, probably should practice this a little better. All right. This is obviously much warmer and much thicker. But you know what? It's not warm. It's just been sitting here on the floor. It's the same temperature as the floor is right now. But if I leave this blanket sleeping bag on for a while, heat that I have been losing to the room around me will instead be emitted by my body and absorbed by this big, thick sleeping bag. And the sleeping bag will warm up. The sleeping bag will warm up a lot more than that afghan did. The afghan's got holes, it's not very thick, it doesn't actually absorb all that much of the heat that I'm losing. The big, thick sleeping bag does. The big, thick sleeping bag absorbs practically all of the heat that my body is emitting. The, if we could measure the temperature of the bag itself, after a few minutes, the bag is actually pretty darn warm. Okay? The bag is emitting heat. Now, admittedly, it's, it's emitting heat outward away from me. That's heat that's just lost. But it is also emitting heat back toward me, which is heat I get back and I feel warm. In fact, just in the few minutes I've been holding this here, this thing's getting really quite uncomfortably warm. It also smells like a campfire. <laughs> anyway, perhaps it's time to take that, uh, my sleeping bag to, uh, to the laundromat. Anyway, um, <clears throat> anyway, same thing is true of the atmosphere. The greenhouse gases in the Earth's atmosphere absorb heat that the surface was losing to space if we didn't have a greenhouse effect. The question is, and then the, the, the greenhouse gases emit that, surf, that radiation back towards the surface of the Earth. The question is, how much do they absorb? Oh, so in the case of the atmosphere, the more greenhouse gases that are up there in the atmosphere, the better the atmosphere is absorbing heat that gets away, which mean, uh, that would otherwise have gotten away, which means that that is now emitting more radiation back towards the surface of the Earth. This sounds like something that is modern. Like, um, you know, you would need satellites to have studied this and, uh, you know, computational computer models and things like that. Um, and those things help, actually. We've really understood the basics of the greenhouse effect surprisingly long. 
um, the properties of things like carbon dioxide and water vapor in contrast to constituents of the atmosphere that aren't greenhouse gases like uh, oxygen and nitrogen have actually been studied since the mid-1800s. Um, and it really actually was pretty well understood. Um, these scientists back in like the mid-19th century like that tended to articulate how this worked like in textbooks of the time and so on as being similar to the way a greenhouse works where a greenhouse, you know, keeps inside of the greenhouse, it stays snugly warm, and you can keep your plants alive all winter and so on in there, even if it's cold on the outside. And in fact, it was Svante Arrhenius. I have to admit, I've never been sure how to pronounce his name. Svante Arrhenius, who was the one who coined the term greenhouse effect. And, uh, you know, in like the 18, in 1896 is what it says on Wikipedia. Long time ago. You might think this is something we actually recently figured out. Oh, no, no, no. Well over 100 years ago. Uh, Svante Arrhenius was the guy who figured out this business of how the atmosphere is holding in the heat in the, because of the action of these very small trace gases that are measured in, like, parts per million and so on in the Earth's atmosphere. The astonishing thing, though, about all of that in some ways is how the term itself is kind of dumb. Because if you look at a greenhouse, like this conservatory I happen to have a picture of on, um, from Wikipedia or something like that, strangely, how greenhouses work has absolutely nothing to do with the greenhouse effect, and in fact has nothing to do at all with radiation even. The term greenhouse effect certainly conjures up a lovely image. I mean, you kind of picture Earth as like this lovely little gem of, of warmth and life uh, with a cold universe outside of it. But that is actually nothing the way a greenhouse effect works. <laughs> the greenhouse, rather, works at all. Greenhouses work because they have a roof, and it seals in the heat that's inside of the, uh, the greenhouse. Um, that warm air that's down there is not allowed to escape up into the atmosphere and get replaced by cold air. If, it was if that warm air was rising vertically, that'd be convection. If the, air, if the wind was taking that heat horizontally, we'd call that advection. You might remember those terms from a couple uh, presentations ago. Um, that has absolutely nothing to do with radiation. It isn't like the glass roof absor is a selective absorber. Well, it is actually a selective absorber, but it is not contributing. There isn't that much radiation being given off by the glass panels of the roof that is somehow warming the tomatoes on the inside of the, of the greenhouse. It actually has literally nothing to do with the greenhouse effect. And the greenhouse effect actually has literally nothing to do with greenhouses. Which is why, some years back, the atmospheric science community proposed, uh, uh, proposed a new name. Instead of calling it the greenhouse effect, they came up with the incredibly lame name of the atmosphere effect. Um, and you'll actually occasionally see that in textbooks and papers and stuff like that, but that is way too lame. <laughs> if you ever hear the term the atmosphere effect, that's what they're talking about. I don't know if your book ever actually says that term or not, but you know, in readings and stuff like that, you might come across that. Um, but the atmosphere effect is just a lame word for greenhouse effect. Even though greenhouses are not working in the same way as the greenhouse effect, it's just a nice image. We understand what we're talking about when we talk about the greenhouse effect. All right, this is not the only time in the course the greenhouse effect is going to come up, but this is kind of the basics of the radiation aspects of the greenhouse effect. Um, before we wrap up this lecture, let's do two quick questions here. Here's question four. The atmospheric window is, okay, that was a vocabulary word along the way in this part of the lecture, a, a layer of the atmosphere which does not absorb radiation, B, a gas in the atmosphere that does not absorb radiation, or C, a range of wavelengths of radiation that is not absorbed by any of the gases in our atmosphere. Ah, oh, that's interesting. Pick one of those three options below to move on and get some feedback before you get to question five.